Hello, I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to World History. Today we're going to continue our study of absolutism and enlightenment by looking at the sort of final outcome of the whole enlightenment movement, the American Revolution. This is our sort of prototypical political revolution, and so we're just going to go through the broadest outline of it because, of course, this isn't my AP US history course. This is world history, and so we're just going to give you the outline to sort of hopefully see how you can track enlightenment ideas and how they were put into place in the context of the Americans' fight for freedom. So here are our objectives for today. Take a moment and take them in, and let's dive into our story. As we talked about previously, the British established a series of colonies along the coast of the, uh, North America. In New England society, you had the religiously based Puritans trying to create a utopian city upon a hill where, where they can live out their Calvinist dream of a perfect society. Obviously, that didn't totally work, and it led to the splitting of the Massachusetts Bay Colony into a bunch of other colonies. But the New England colonies generally focused on small-scale farming, some small manufacturing, trade, fishing, stuff like that. The middle colonies are a religiously diverse and tolerant hodgepodge of different European groups, uh, focusing on a whole bunch of different industries. And in the southern colonies, you saw the rise of plantation agriculture, specifically focused on tobacco, and eventually, after Bacon's Rebellion, the rise of chattel slavery and the use of enslaved people on plantations. So you've got these three distinct colonial regions, none of which are tied together by much except a loose connection with England. Well, all of this is going to change after the Seven Years' War. We've talked about the Seven Years' War in the context of European society. Well, in the Americas, it was known as the French and Indian War, and it was a battle, it was a war that was started by a guy named George Washington, who was, in, who, uh, was leading the, um, the British incursion into the Ohio River Valley and running into French forts there and their Native American allies. And so in the Seven Years' War, Britain and their Native American allies fought against France and their Native American allies. The loosest description of it is that in the Ohio River Valley, in general, the British lost to the French and Native Americans, where up in the north, the British were able to use their superior naval forces to win. And so in the aftermath of this whole in the aftermath of this whole fight, England ended up getting control of the Ohio River Valley after defeating the French forts in the north, but incredibly powerful Native American tribes led by a chief named Pontiac of the Ottawa peoples fought back and rather than try to bring all of their resources to fight a probably unwinnable war in the Ohio here, the British drew what was called a proclamation line to attempt to slow the pace of westward settlement. This would, of course, both outrage the American colonists who had just fought a war in order to move westward, but also uh, and also failed to keep peace, peace with the Native Americans as the as the colonists would continue to move westward, violating the proclamation line. The Seven Years' War also put England tremendously into debt, and so they needed to find some way to pay that debt. And so they tried to come up with a variety of different ways to tax the North American colonies. These taxes, including the dreaded Stamp Act, which was a tax on paper, led to significant resistance within the American colonies and started to create a rift between Britain and, uh, Britain and their North American colonists. Here's your Virginia resolves. Take a moment and answer the questions about it. So this idea of self-taxation becomes very important to the American Revolution going forward. And we see significant riots over the town, the Stamp Act, over the Townshend duties, which would eventually lead to the Boston Massacre. And of course, eventually, so here's your uh, description of the, the anarchy in Boston over the Stamp Act. Take a moment and read and answer the questions associated with this. And so we're seeing significant mob violence in Boston. And we're starting to see larger organized resistance. The colonies started to put together shadow governments known as committees of correspondence. And especially after a British tea policy, namely trying to give the East India Company a way to import tea directly into the colonies, led to a tea protest and the Boston Tea Party. The British shut down the city of Boston and put Boston under martial law, which led the colonies to call a Continental Congress, a unity, a unifying government of all the colonies in order to help organize resistance against Great Britain. This resistance began to take the form of militias trying to find and secure sources of gunpowder and eventually led to the shot heard around the world, the battles of Lexington and Concord, which eventually became the beginning of the American War for Independence. 
In response to all of this, the colonists first drafted an olive branch petition to try to uh, reconcile things with England and to try to silence doubters. When the king rejected the olive branch, Thomas Jefferson and others wrote these famous words, which will give you a moment to pause, which you should pause and answer the questions about. Establishing, these established the principles by which the American Revolution was supposedly fought and established that independence from Great Britain would be the eventual goal. The war for independence was a long and complicated struggle, and you should absolutely watch my videos in AP US history or, uh, you know, take my AP US history course if you're interested in learning more about it. For now, basically, the Americans failed to launch an invasion of Canada. Washington is going to get chased around sort of the northern part, uh, the middle part of the colonies by a guy named General Cornwallis. Eventually, we're going to win a very decisive victory at the Battle of Saratoga where American militia forces defeat a British army marching southward. And from there, the war is going to move south. Here's, a, here's an appeal of enslaved people to Thomas Gage, showing some of the fault lines within the American Revolution and the people who were not included in All Men Are Created Equal. So pause and answer questions here. Enslaved people fought on all sides of the conflict, but in general, Enslaved people felt like if they had, that the British would offer them better terms. In Virginia, the royal governor, Lord Dunmore, offered freedom to any enslaved person who would run away and fight. And throughout the colonies, enslaved people would generally escape to join the British, feeling that the Americans were much less likely to free them because, of course, they were still economically dependent on their labor. The Battle of Saratoga in the north was a major turning point because it brought the French into alliance with the Americans. There was then a sort of running battle across the South where Nathaniel Green and Francis Marion and other American patriots fought a war of attrition against the British General Cornwallis. Cornwallis eventually gave up trying to pacify the South and move northward to Yorktown, where he was trapped by a coalition of George Washington, the Marquis de Lafayette, and a French fleet. With this British fleet, with this last British army at Yorktown defeated, the British eventually lost the will to fight, being massively in debt and being no closer to pacifying the colonies than they were after in the beginning, after six years of warfare, and the American colonies became independent. In the aftermath of independence, the American colonies entered into what's called the critical period. The government that had gotten them through the revolution, the Articles of Confederation, was incredibly weak and lacked power to tax. There was a climatic moment in which a group of army officers stationed in Newburgh, New York, threatened to mutiny and march on the Continental Congress in uh, Philadelphia, forcing them to uh, establish money to pay them. This is, of course, very reminiscent of the new model army marching in and occupying London in the aftermath of the English Civil War. Fortunately for American democracy, George Washington famously showed up at one of these meetings, refused to leave, and gave this famous Newburgh speech. So take a minute to pause and answer the questions about the Newburgh speech. So the inability to pay the army was a clear weakness of the Articles of Confederation. There was also a significant rebellion going on in Massachusetts known as Shays Rebellion. Daniel Shays was a Revolutionary War veteran who had been paid in worthless continental money. And when he returned to his farm in Massachusetts, he found that he was in huge amounts of debt that he could not pay off, and his farm was about to be foreclosed upon. He and his other farmers who were in similar situations took up arms and defeated slash uh, had the Massachusetts militia uh, mutiny to join them. And Massachusetts was unable to put down this force. They asked the other states for help uh, who, re who refused because the Articles of Confederation could not compel the, national, the other states to join in and no one else wanted to pay for the defense of Massachusetts. So all this basically led the Americans to decide that the Articles of Confederation didn't work there was no adequate means of reforming it. It was time to overthrow this government and perform extra legal actions to write a new government. The new government that they wrote in, in the Constitutional Convention of Philadelphia became known as the Constitution. It was based on a rough draft by a Virginia planter known as James Madison, but included all of a lot of our great Enlightenment theories. You've got the whole social contract of John Locke in there. You've got Montesquieu's distribution of powers. You've got Beccaria's independent judiciary with jury and trial by our peers. You've got, uh, obviously, the three branches of government. 
you've got the great compromise between the House of Representatives and the Senate, where every state would get equal representation in the Senate, but each state would have proportional representation according to their population in the House of Representatives. So big states were happy to be able to control the House of Representatives, whereas small states were com content to be equal in the Senate. And so all of these compromises led the Constitution to be eventually be ratified in special nominating conventions by the states outside of the framework of the Articles of Confederation. So all of this process was extra legal, but because you had people like Benjamin Franklin and George Washington involved in the process, people were able to support this whole process and were okay with replacing the Articles of Confederation with this new government. The principles of the Constitution are laid out here in the preamble, so take a moment and pause and answer questions here. And so we see the United States becoming sort of a testing ground for at least the political theories associated with the Enlightenment. George Washington became the first president, and in the end, and in the end, he is going to embody a lot of the principles and he's going to establish a lot of the precedents that are going to be laid out in the Constitution. For example, the cabinet system is going to be established by George Washington. Uh, he is going to only serve two terms, which establishes term limits for presidents. He's going to wear civilian clothing. He's going to uh, try to push neutrality in foreign affairs and keeping the United States out of sort of foreign alliances. And he's going to give a farewell address that sort of uh, uh, hopes to push us to not have political parties, although we don't necessarily follow along with that. He's also going to push an economic plan led by a guy named Alexander Hamilton, which is going to create a national bank and a protective tariff and to try to finance our debt through a whiskey tax. That whiskey tax provokes a rebellion in Pennsylvania, but unlike Shays' rebellion, Washington is able to now raise an army and march out to pacify the rebels in Pennsylvania. And so this is going to demonstrate the effectiveness of the Constitution in contrast to the Articles of Confederation. The main debate during Washington's term is how the Constitution should be interpreted. And so we start to see factions developing. Alexander Hamilton's faction is going to become known as the Federalists. They are going to support what's called broad construction, which is the idea that the Constitution should be interpreted broadly, and you should be able to use what's called the Elastic Clause, which is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, which says that Congress shall have the power to, quote, make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregone, foregoing powers of the Constitution. Basically, this means that Congress has the ability to make all laws which are proper to do the basic, uh, the basic tasks that the Constitution lays out. And so he argued that this gave Congress the authority to do things like create a national bank and potentially do other stuff. Opposed to this were the Democratic Republicans, led by Thomas Jefferson, who argued that Congress should only have the specific powers listed in the Constitution and that the Elastic Clause gave Congress too broad authority and may allowed the legislature to potentially become tyrannical. This debate between the two of them would lead to the creation of the first two political parties in American history and, and the first contested elections of 1796 and 1800. Eventually, Thomas Jefferson would become president in 1800, significantly shrinking the size of the federal government and proving that the government was durable enough to withstand a transfer of power from one party to another. Eventually, the independence of the United States would be tested in the War of 1812. The War of 1812 established, uh, again, America's independence against Great Britain. Uh, we were able to defeat a series of Native American tribes in the Ohio River Valley, first the Tecumseh at the Battle of Tippecanoe and later at the Battle of the Thames. We also were able to stop Great Britain from impressing our sailors through defeating one of their ships on the high seas. The USS Constitution defeated the USS Guerre, again establishing that Americas can some degree stand up to Great Britain. And despite the fact that the capital was taken and the White House was burned to the ground by the British, we defeated, or Andrew Jackson, defeated a large British force at the Battle of New Orleans. Even though this was after the war had concluded, it made us feel as if we won the war. So here's James Madison metaphorically punching the King of England in his face, demonstrating the independence of America and the fact that we could sort of stand up to European powers. So the War of 1812 both paved the way for further westward expansion and established that England would not be able to re-exert control over its former American colonies. So this created this sense of American identity. 
established here by J. Hector St. John. So take a minute to pause and establish who these new Americans say that they are. Finally, in the antebellum period, the United States starts pushing westward, passing high protective tariffs, creating a new national bank, establishing roads and canals to connect the country together, establishing that we're going to develop ourselves into an economic power, we're going to attempt to develop industry in order to challenge Great Britain, and we're going to become a large mercantile commercial nation, at least in the northern states, and that the government is going to have some role in economic development. Although this economic vision is going to be challenged by Andrew Jackson and the Democrats, this is the, the path of industrialization is not going to be stopped. And the United States is going to develop into somewhat two parallel societies, the industrialized northern states and the agrarian, slave-owning, cash-crop-producing southern states. We're going to pick up this thread later, and of course, this is just the broadest explanation of American history. My U.S. history videos go into much more detail about this, as does my AP U.S. history class. But for world history, these are just the pieces you need to know to sort of understand how the United States became a thing and why it's going to become an economic powerhouse in the future. So those are our objectives for today. Hopefully you can explain them in some detail, and thank you for listening.